The first of two films reflecting the views of those caught in the net of a contracting industry. Fish and ships. Fishermen of England, that ancient seafaring race, no longer. For virtually the last big English trawler has sailed, done a trip, and now returned. This is the story of four men from that Grimsby crew. Ships? There isn't any ships, is there? I mean, years ago there was trolls, big trolls, 180 footers. Now you're down to 60 foot. Grimsby, it was a fishing port, and that's what you did when you left school. You went to sea, fishing. Something I wanted to do from being about eight year old. My father was a fisherman, so I just thought, well, we'll carry on. Especially when I failed my eyesight test, couldn't get in the merchant navy. So, well, fishing's the next step, I'll do that. And that's what I did for the rest of my life up to now. Can't say I ever actually enjoy fishing. It was a job. No, you, nobody really enjoys fishing. Too much. It's too hard a job to enjoy. It was a job that you did. You got plenty of satisfaction out of it. And you hated the job. Everything about the job was just to have. 
Nobody wanted to do it. And that's all there was, so he did it. Once you come in dock, you forgot what happened the trip before. You just completely forgot about that, so you went for another fresh start. Huh? Two or three days in dock was enough for me. Be fed up. Wanna go back. You was there. Once you got on a trailer, that was it. You was there until you wanted to die. So you always had that career for life. So in a way, it's saddening that it's packed up because it's it's been there all the time. You know, ten years ago, nobody ever thought it'd come to this. You know, the finish. No more ships. Now it's gone. Nobody's got the opportunity anymore. All because of governments and troll around us. <laughs> You've just, just been thrown to the wind. They've just said, that's it. Finish the fleet and that's the end of it. Not so much used as cast aside. In 1974, Grimsby's distant water fleet had 2,000 fishermen. Today, there are none. Long years as a decky, I hauled for me living and dodged on the deck. Tight grip of fear as the cold sea swept o'er me, and I soon learned the truth of the old trolling tales. You know, you spent a full lifetime at sea, and then you just kick to one side. You're offered nothing, absolutely nothing, and you get nothing for it. I didn't mind the work, all the messing about and the messed about you got. But uh, to finish up with nothing, it's a terrible thing. In this day and age, anyhow. Well, uh, really, it, it was bred into you, fishing. And uh, your friends was all fishing, and uh, it's like, you, as you, was, I was 16, and perhaps my friends was 17, 18, you looked up to them and think, oh, great fellas, you know. That went fishing, but that was the only thing in Grimsby. You either went fishing or you was on the other side filleting and packing. So really, that was all there was here. The all the town more or less lived by fishing. I mean, don't forget we was the biggest fishing port in the world. Grimsby. Yeah. It was a boom town. Yeah. It really was. It was a lovely town. Oh, you you, uh, you come in and you had a job to find a berth. Anyhow, there was that many ships there. Perhaps uh, ten deep water ships. And uh, anywhere from 50 to 70 North Sea ships. And then there was uh, Middle Water ships as well. And uh, say each fair med, ooh, 40, 50s, as high as 80 and 90 ships. Close on 1,000 men, I should imagine.
Oh, it was fabulous. It was fabulous. It was a bona bonanza day, landing day. Every day, a thousand men landed with three weeks' money in their pockets and three weeks' living to cram into two days ashore. I mean, uh, there was the, the men coming up from dock with, with a few pounds, what they had, like, picked up and that, and it was all spent down Freeman Street. And all the wives, the, the children and, and everything. It was a, really a great day out, because you sailed the day after you landed. It was only in dock two days at the most. All right, it seemed a lot of money, but, I mean, imagine you're spending money over three weeks and you, you've got it for one day, so... I mean, you'd do a similar thing, wouldn't you? Which, uh... <laughs> I mean, it was a fantastic place. It's nothing now, absolutely nothing. It's a ghost yeah. town. There's nothing, absolutely nothing. You go out now, if you go out, call in anywhere, it's empty, the places. People haven't got the money. For every fisherman at sea, there were 20 jobs ashore. Shipwrights, chandlers, engineers, filleters, fish merchants, and many, many more all dependent on the fishing, most now gone. Well, it's absolutely dead. It's <laughs> just like going down a graveyard. And it's a shame, really. But bad trips were not uncommon, and men often landed in debt. Terrible, I don't know how. People really lived on the money with a family, with children, because uh, I only had one son, but I went to work, I had to go to work, because the money was nothing. I mean, we've had times when there's most summers, ships laid up, the firms only run the best ships, you know, markets was bad and all that, so we got jobs. <laughs> as soon as they sent the ships to sea again, you're back again. Yeah. God knows why we do We don't know. I said I, to him I once, don't think anybody's got an answer. What, what do you go to sea for? You get trek like dogs. It's not enough money. What do you go for? He said, oh, you don't understand, love. It's a challenge out there. It's man's work, he said. It's a challenge. I don't, I don't really know, think anybody's got the answer. Not really. And he collapsed at sea. And his doctor said there was no more sea. And he was at home and he was a miserable man. And I said to him one day, if you want to go back to sea, go. I said, but you've got to pass the doctor on the docks yet. He said, I've already passed him. I don't know when he did, but he passed him. Next day he got a ship and he was off. I thought he'll know the difference. When he, when he comes home and he knows, realises, and he came in, I said, now then, with a smirk on my face, what was it like? He said, it was like holiday. It was like a pleasure trip. It was beautiful. <laughs> the situation now, it's hopeless. It's, there, isn't a, there isn't a future in fishing, there's nothing. So we're just living on social. Once there were hundreds of mid or deep water trawlers. Even in 1974, Grimsby had a hundred. Today, there are none. 
they're either laid up or out of fishing altogether. And in between trips, well, the town couldn't hold me. A two-day tycoon with me head full of rum. A girl on each arm and a pocket soon empty. Live now and pay later, there's hard days to come. Well, no, nobody think, thought it would uh, you know, come down as quick as it did. I don't think so, anyhow. I, I never. Not trawling. See, uh, when I started, there was getting a freezer trawlers in as well, and everything looked bright for the future. The reason I went fishing was uh, because all my family had been fishing. My father had been fishing. I had brother-in-laws who was fishing and uncles. So I thought it was the best thing to do. And uh, the money, I read about the money. And uh, when I was at school, we used to go down the town and I uh, always seemed to see fishermen enjoying themselves. So I uh, thought that'd be my life. You know, for my age, at 15, I was uh, earning, you know, as Declina, I was earning good money. I was in a ship called the Valinda, it was uh, one of the top earners. And, uh, yeah, the money was good. I wouldn't have got it anywhere else, not in any other job for a 15 year old. On landing day, I felt like a millionaire. <laughs> oh, taxis, yeah, yeah. there's taxis all the time. Must have made a fortune out of those taxis. Uh, yeah, you used to have a taxi take you all over. Sometimes you had a taxi with you all day and just pay them at the end of the day, you know. When I was uh, 17, 18, we used to come in the dock. And all the lads used to have like, the dinner times out in a pub. In the night time, like all the young uns, we used to all go down to uh, the ship disc. That was in the old marketplace. And that was a real lively place, that was. It was just drinking, dancing, and uh, nine times out of ten, there used to be fights. Right. Real rowdy, you know. Just one big thing, we used to buy, like, suits and all the gear, you know. It was a good time, wasn't it? Like, fish, what are called fisherman suits. And you could have up to six or seven, some blokes. You know, one for the dinner and one for the night. Man of going out and enjoying yourself till you went away again. What time you had, like? Was you your landing day, and then the day after, like a day in the dock, and then you was away again. You never had a worry that uh, you'd be having to look for work, you know, and be out of work for say six or eight weeks, like I have. You you always knew that if you come out of a ship, the chance to get into the ship the next week. You know, it was good. I mean, that's seventies. You know, but there's always a job.
job. He's dead, isn't he? Ah, oh, the situation now is you, you just walk around the dock and hope that you can uh, get a job. A fish. Almost half of it prime quality from Icelandic waters. Grimsby's small inshore fleet now lands around 16,000 tonnes and does well to achieve that. Now I know every hull as it tops the horizon I've learned all the tricks of the trawlerman's trade Know the sea as provider, betrayer and taker I've got me mate's ticket, me future They give in to Iceland too easy. I think we, if we'd have stuck out a bit longer, we'd have, we'd have been still fishing there today. But, because uh, we was taking the yard part when we was getting chopped, the gears chopped away from us, and we were sticking it out. We didn't know where uh, grubs about it. Distant water fishing off Iceland and in Russia's White Sea gave Grimsby its prosperity. The loss of the English trawling fleet is a long drawn out tale of woe, mismanagement and power politics, leading to the loss of those rich grounds without any adequate replacements. The Sorry Saga began in earnest with the first Cod War in 1958. Iceland extended her fishing limits from four to 12 miles, seeking to exclude trawlers from that area with gunboat patrols. In 1961, Britain accepted the 12 mile limit. This Cod War had little effect on the fleet, but it was an ominous sign of things to come. Fishing continued, and then 1972, the second Cod War, with Iceland extending from 12 to 50 miles, claiming some of the richest fishing grounds in the world. Gunboats patrolled again. In so much as that um they was trying to stop us fishing. Uh, we believed that we had the right to be there, as you know, our fathers and forefathers uh, from Grimsby and Hall had opened these waters up. Well, to us it was just a game that we had to win. And unfortunately, uh, we didn't win. I was in the world before us right through the, the last Cod War, um, and uh, one of the things that, uh, that happened was we was fishing at, um, at Iceland off uh, Langaness and uh, the uh, Icelandic gunboat was, was knocking about. Uh, so what we used to do, we used to fish two ships. One ship would be trawling, the other ship would uh, sort of steam on his, on his stern over his trawl so that the gunboat couldn't get in between to chop the trawl away. Uh, yeah, it was it was dangerous uh, in that when they chopped the warps. I mean, the wires came back aboard the ship, and I mean, the wires was under tremendous pressure. Um, that if they hit anybody, they'd kill you. No doubt about that. And um, some of the tricks that uh, the gunboat did, I mean, to our naval vessels, um, was ridiculous. You know.
and the relation of my wife's. He was on the uh, Everton when she she had nine shells put through her. And the Navy laid her on her side at sea and patched her up. But yeah, it was dangerous. I mean, they fired live ammunition at us. The British Navy played cat and mouse with the Icelandic gunboats, trying to keep the trawlers fishing. I don't know, there's pressure coming from somewhere. There's a lot of pressure coming from somewhere and we don't know where it was from. Politics, mostly. Politics, the EEC. British government, they've got no spine in them for a start. There's no backbone. As regards fishing, there's no backbone to the British government. Early in 1973, Joseph Godber, then Conservative Fisheries Minister, said, The Icelanders are acting illegally. We are determined to give what support the industry wants. The Icelandic NATO base at Keflavik is strategically vital to the Western defence. In the early autumn of 1973, Iceland demanded either their limits be recognised or NATO must leave Keflavik. The West feared Russian domination of the North Atlantic. In November 1973, Britain accepted the 50-mile limit and 400 Grimsby fishermen lost their livelihoods. Fishing continued. And then, 1975, the Third Cod War. Iceland proclaimed a 200-mile limit. Gunboats were on patrol again. Roy Hattersley, then Labour Minister of State at the Foreign Office, warned, if moderation in terms of negotiation does not prevail, then the British fishing fleet catching the fish it needs under the legitimate and legal protection of the British Navy will prevail. Negotiations began, and the Icelanders offered an annual quota of 65,000 tonnes that British trawlers could catch in their waters. I think they should have done. We know it's only a small quota, but there'd been so many ships still going. Instead of being chucked out, nobody to go. That small quota maybe kept ten ships going. Ten deep water ships. And it could have been the same in Norway. We had so many ships running there on a quota. It maybe kept five or ten ships in principle each way. Going ten going the other way and ten going that way. It's then you had your near water fleet. We'd have had all these ships still in Grimsby. A former top skipper who represented the British Trawlers Federation during these negotiations was Don Lister. A starting point was 70,000 tonne. And Roy Hattersley showed me a paper from uh, one of the meetings that he had been to with the Icelandic Foreign Minister. And there was more or less a demand for 110,000 tonnes. And I tried to point it out that we couldn't catch 110,000 tonnes. We never had the ships to catch 110,000 tonnes. And the answer I got was that Harold Wilson told me to start at 110,000 tonnes. I said, we can't catch it. We haven't got the ships to catch it. Feelings ran high in Iceland against the British. The British Embassy was attacked. In early 1976, Iceland again threatened that NATO would be expelled from their Keflavik base if the limits were not accepted. In mid-1976, the Third Cod War ended. The 200-mile limit accepted. The NATO base made secure. Britain ultimately received no quota at all. Joining the EEC in 1973 had given other European countries access to Britain's North Sea waters. Both Norway and Russia declared 200 mile limits. So having lost their traditional grounds, the fleet found that their own waters were not protected. Other nations had fleets suited to those waters. Britain did not. 
trawler owners had just not invested in suitable vessels. Took everything out of the job and they wouldn't put anything back. That is one of the reasons why the fleece disappeared. In my opinion, anyway. The, uh, they let the ship go to wreck and ruin. Just wouldn't put anything back in them. You'd have still had a fleet now if you'd have had decent troll around it. Grimsby now has only a small fleet of inshore fishing boats struggling to survive. They realised what was happening to the industry well before we did. And they should have invested in multi-purpose ships. You'd have had a fleet now. Something that could be done without having to convert ships, you know. But they didn't. They just took everything out of the job and didn't bother putting out back. Well, when I came ashore uh, from skipper to uh, managing consolidated fisheries, um, I had a look around me after I'd been ashore for about uh, a month. It only took me about a month. And I, I just sat and thought to myself, God, is, is these the people that I've been working for? And uh, are these the people that uh, are responsible for me to get in a living and to get them a living? And uh, I was just amazed at uh, the incompetence of them. I think they was the kind of people, perhaps, that um, went to bed and, and forgot uh, what was happening at the night time and that the people that they employed was working day and night. Our deckies had to work 20 hours a day in atrocious conditions, uh, we was pushed to the extreme. The jackal's final catch is unloaded overnight for the early morning market. The catch is less than half what it would have caught in its heyday. We sailed. No saying that you was finished when you come in dock or anything. We come in dock, we may have landed, went to the office to settle up, sign here, you're finished. That was it. The average sea pay for a deckhand on the jackal was £12 a day, plus a small percentage of the catcher's profit, if any. No redundancy. And it's... I think it's wrong that we shouldn't get... You get a miner, you get lumpers. You don't matter where you look in the country, they all get redundantly. Why shouldn't fishermen? <laughs> it wasn't trek like men, not, not really. It's every trip. They've signed you off and you've had to go on the labour for two or three days. Then they order you to go away again. That's the reason why they catch you. It's all imported now. Mm. Fish through, through Grimsby still. It's still the biggest buyer of fish mm. in the British Isles. It comes I think from you've everywhere. Been sold out. And I think it's disgusting that you haven't got nothing after all these years. No, in, no redundancy and nothing makes me sick to think about well, it. Well, that's a fisherman now, Laura, isn't he? Fool. <laughs> <laughs> all these years you've gone to sea, right from being a young boy. I mean, 
it really gets me, I can really get annoyed, re very annoyed about it. What can I do? A test case, which may secure redundancy money for thousands of fishermen, is on appeal at present. The case was rejected earlier because fishermen were classified as not having been in continuous employment, only casual workers, and so not entitled to redundancy. Even if, like John Foster, they have been fishermen for approaching 50 years. None of the Jackal's crew of 13 has received redundancy money. Only four are still fishing, and their future is precarious. Since the Jackal's final trip, all the crew has at some time been unemployed. British United trawlers ran the last of the once proud Grimsby distant water fleet, including the Jackal. They received £1,610,000 from the government for taking eight such boats out of fishing. They were then allowed to keep those boats and sell them. In other European countries, the crews of such decommissioned boats receive compensation. British United Trawlers managing director said, nobody here wants to say anything about anything. Scott Watson, a potential skipper if the fleet had still existed, now often walks the empty docks, looking for a berth. The only other place now is to look at the field, isn't it? Yeah, how about that? I've heard there's where it might be in low stock, but uh, you don't know, do you? Well, you when don't. you get there, you've got to find somewhere to stay while you're looking for work. Yeah, well, it's prospect of getting down yeah. there, isn't it? Christmas on top here and see what, the, see what the new year brings, that's all we can do. Now the last trip is over, the long years are squandered, the fishing ground stolen by far faceless men. No bonus, no bounty, no gold in the handshake that sends us to stand in the dole queues again. The test case for redundancy money mentioned in the programme failed at the Court of Appeal and leave to make a further appeal to the House of Lords was not granted. Part two of Fish and Ships witnesses the effect of the industry's decline on those left on the shoreline, the fishermen's wives and families. That's on Wednesday at nine on four. There's a book entitled Fish and Chips by John Goddard and Roger Spaulding, available priced £5.95 from all good bookshops and there's a free poster leaflet giving further information on all the programmes in the series. And if you'd like a copy, please send a large stamped addressed envelope to People to People, P.O. Box 4000, London W3, 